My name is Tom Wiscom, Chair of the Undergraduate Program here at SciArc. If you don't know me, I think I know most of you. Uh, but I also am very happy to see some faces that I don't know. And one of the intentions of this SciArc Cinema series is that we um, can invite in and welcome people from the Arts District around SciArc and from downtown and other places. So this is the inaugural night. And, um, and uh, well, I'm going to get going here. So, so First of all, um, this, the cinema series came out of an idea a couple of years ago to begin to bring the liberal arts um, uh, uh, and, uh, as an initiative into the school of architecture um, with the idea that, that we can as architects make uh, or stumble into disciplinary inventions by looking at things and knowing and having deep knowledge of things um, outside of our own discipline. Uh, film is one of those things. Uh, also, in the last year, philosophy has become one of those things, and art and science and other things that we brought into the curriculum and also into the masterclass series. Um, so uh, I think, though, especially film is important to SciArc and its history. Um, uh, I think that there has been a giant interest in film uh, in the last 15 years at the school. First, maybe starting as animation and animation tools, the idea of animating or the moving image. Um, then moving on into um, uh, special effects, and even today, narrative and other issues related to that. Um, and, and that's also, in a way, that's, that's bred um, our, post, uh, our postgraduate program called Fiction and Entertainment. So, so I think that film is crucial, it's everywhere, it's all around us, and, um, and I'm really excited to be, um, to be uh, embarking on this kind of journey right now. So, um, all, of these, all of these cinema series events will be open to the public and they will be front-ended by special content, including our MC, who is Michael Stock, who's a professor here at SciArc, also KXLU DJ, as you know. Um, and, uh, and to a great extent, the, um, tonight wouldn't be possible without all of the work that Michael's done on this project. And, um, and it's, I think that I wanna say that the point of these events and having this front end discussion before we screen the movie that you all know we're going to see is not to just reveal all of its secrets, not to just reveal all of the processes involved in the manufacture of the film as, a, as an object or as a thing in culture, um, but it's in a way to just start talking about the genealogy of the film and like the influences of the film and who was involved what where, when, who did what, who said what, what mistake was made when, what film or what idea preceded an idea for another film that then leapfrogged it. Um, so all of these things go on in architecture, as we well know, and I think that in film, it's interesting, it goes on in a very similar way. So, so I'm very interested to hear about that. And it's not about pulling away the curtain like in The Wizard of Oz to reveal the wizard behind. It's really about maintaining the ambiguity of, of, the, of the medium, uh, uh, but it's also recognizing the relationship to architecture. So um, who better off, honestly, than uh, to kick off the series than, than with a, a, a Kubrick film, The Shining? Uh, you know, he's an absolute master of his form, his craft, obsessive. Uh, um, dedicated to the production of a new realism, you know, and as you guys know, he's, you know, he uh, is author of 13 films, the content of which is radically different, uh, uh, but still he brings his authorship to the table in each one of these films, and you can in a way examine the work of Kubrick sort of one by one, like film by film, or look at them as a family of films um, uh, created with a certain kind of authorship, which I think is am also ambiguous and interesting. So, The Shining. Uh, why are we starting with The Shining? Uh, I, I find this to be a, a very architectural piece. Um, I think that uh, how it's set and where it's set, uh, uh, what its story is versus what appears to be happening on the screen is really interesting. Also, how it was filmed on the ground is very interesting and you may or may not know that and that's also crucial to its viewing. And all of these things kind of ungrounds the, the work. Um, one thing to note is that, uh, is that there are very few scenes outside of the land that Kubrick has constructed, this kind of interior world. Um, even when the actors are outside, like as in the maze sequences, they're inside and highly controlled. 
Are those plants? Is that snow? On the interior, it can also be quite consuming. The giant lobbies and those endless hallways, uh, strange dining rooms, all of it collapses into a kind of interior world, uh, the extents of which are unclear as you watch the film and become especially ambiguous as you see the establishing shots of the Outlook Hotel, which is supposedly in Colorado. Um, all of these innards or inside worlds um, cannot possibly fit into this outside shell that's envisioned in the establishing shots of the movie. Um, is it even Colorado? I don't know. I grew up in Colorado. Everybody told me it was filmed in Colorado, but maybe it's not. Maybe it wasn't. Um, so, okay, so uh, um, one other thing I wanted to say is that the hotel in this movie is, is really e excitingly interesting because it, it's a living entity. The hotel is like a member of the cast um, of, a, of a kind of ensemble cast in a way. Um, it lives, it makes music, it reflects things that humans do. It has gaps and subdivisions that change, apparently. It even bleeds. So um, it's a living entity, much like Jack Nicholson and Shelley Duvall, and it feels alive, if they're even alive. Uh, and the last thing I want to say about, about um, Kubrick's fasc fascination with realism um, uh, rather than the real, is something I saw last night in Vivian Kubrick's documentary about this movie that we're about to show, which I had never seen before. And she's the daughter of Stanley. And, uh, and there was this amazing short sequence of Jack Nicholson talking about the real in there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of so, sort of paraphrase or quote him. Successful acting is always measured based on how real it seems. But it's really one fashion of unreal after another that passes as real. You go mad with realism. Then you come against someone like Stanley who says, yeah, it's real, but it's not that interesting. I thought I liked that. Anyway, um, so I just want, again, I want to thank Michael Stock for putting this whole thing together. I also want to thank um, uh, Hernan Diaz Alonso, our director, who, um, who uh, uh, um, has given institutional support for this series, which is crucial to make it happen. And maybe um, most of all, I want to, I want to introduce um, Jan Harlan, who's here, our special guest, on a long flight from the UK, came all the way here to visit us and do the master class. Um, I'm really excited to have uh, Jan here. He's, um, he worked with Stanley Kubrick for 30 years. I met him in 69. Uh, uh, of course, you guys know Stanley Kubrick died in, in 1999, right after the, the filming of Eyes Wide Shut. And, um, and Jan uh, was the executive producer of, of all of his films from 1975 to 1999. So he knows the ins and outs of Eyes Wide Shut, of Full Metal Jacket, of, um, of The Shining, obviously, worked on The Clockwork Orange as well, and many other films. But of course, he also knows the, the, the inside details on, on some of the earlier films of Kubrick. And he even finished, um, uh, artificial intelligence AI uh, with, with director Steven Spielberg after the death of, of Stanley Kubrick in 1999. So, um, and one, one final thing I want to say about Jan, and then I'll let them go, is that he also is a kind of master archivist uh, of the work of Stanley Kubrick. And it's so amazing to have people in the world like him who will take on the oeuvre of an artist like Kubrick and, and, and give it back to the world. And he's done it in several forms. One, and the, the way that I actually know who you are is through your documentary uh, uh, about Stanley Kubrick, which is called Stanley Kubrick, A Life in Pictures, which I saw a couple of years ago and it took my breath away. Uh, and also through the traveling exhibition of Kubrick, which many of you saw at LACMA, the LA County Art Museum, a while ago, which has traveled all around the world. And so, so I think that's a, um, uh, it's, it's an amazing thing to have that kind of afterlife of, his, of Stanley Kubrick's work. And, um, and it's really exciting to have him here. And just the very last thing I want to say is I'm so excited that we are that we're going to be ending your master class with a screening of Dr. Strangelove on Thursday night, which is a film that I think, it's, it's always been one of my favorite films, but it's a film that I think is almost, it's like fascinatingly relevant right now with what's going on in America and with our political reality and in this moment right now. So with that, uh, I want to introduce again Michael Stock and Jan Harlan, and, um, and thank you guys very much and look forward to what you say. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right.
Welcome all. Uh, so what I put together, typed up on my list here of, of many questions, uh, I wanted to start, Jan, by uh, I guess the beginning, and then go through a few of the early films and then really get our teeth into some of the issues dealing with The Shining, which we'll be watching tonight. Um, my can, I, can I start by quoting? You can interrupt me already. Can I start by quoting Stanley Kubrick? Yes. Never introduce the film. Never introduce the film because yeah, there, there's no point. Unless you want to say, oh, there's something wrong with it, a reel is missing, or, or you know, it's badly scratched because. Otherwise, don't talk about the film. Let the people watch it afterwards you talk about the film. Uh, well, so much for my plan. I'm just quoting Stanley Kubrick. You may not be, uh, yeah, that, 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 it's clearly one thing. Never introduce a film because you're telling them actually indirectly there's something wrong with it. Otherwise, why would you talk about it? Well, here, so here's my theory. All right. Already going off script. To me, as historian of film, of music, for my enjoyment anyway, it, my enjoyment is always deepened by context, by history, by, uh, I don't want to know what the film is about ahead of time. Please don't tell me, uh, as you in my classes know that. I'm not going to tell that. you what it is about. <laughs> I would never do that. But I do think that, that uh, yeah, that there are other la levels, layers of the film that can be enjoyed by talking about some of the things ahead of time. And anyway, I've got some really great questions for you. So okay. Just I, I can just tell, go with tell you one thing about the film. <laughs> when it starts, it's not made for uh, National Geographic. Because it's beautiful landscape. You see Colorado, the mountains, and beautiful. And you know, uh, we thought, well, I mean, this is a bit strange because you have to be totally honest with the film. This is misleading, you know? So how did we do it? Listen to the music. The music tells you right away there's something wrong. It's what I'm looking at is not what I'm going to get. <laughs> End of story. Good. Uh, so so uh, I, I wanted to start, I guess, before the beginning, um, before you started working with Kubrick, and instead ask you how you first heard of Kubrick. And uh, if, I guess, I, I want to try to take all the, film go all the film goers of 2017 in the room here back to a time when you would find out about directors, about films by word of mouth, you know, pre-internet. So how did you find out about Kubrick? How about Kubrick? Yeah. I was at school, and he was married to my sister. <laughs> I mean, he, 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 was the, he was the guy who was married to me. I had no interest in him. Well, he said, you know, my sister married this guy. He was a film guy. Bye. So, you know, I, I did my thing. I had a different, uh, uh, completely different interests. I loved movies. But you know, many people love movies. Yeah. So that's nothing special. And uh, I, my, my previous profession was business planning, organizing, planning, planning, you know, uh, critical path. That's what I have studied, that's what I have done. I did that in Zurich, in Frankfurt, in Vienna, and in New York. I was a green card holder in New York in 1963. Loved it, absolutely loved it. It was such an experience. Kubrick was along with his three kids and my sister in, 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 in London, and they did Dr. Strangelove. I lived in New York. Uh, they came back, and uh, that, that's the time when I really met him properly because I visited my sister and the children, and so he, this guy was there as well. And, uh, and so we had dinner together and blah, 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 and over a year I met him very, very I mean, very intensely. Also, Arthur C. Clarke came, uh -huh. and uh, I was very often present when they had the uh, first, first sort of designs on this film that was later called 2001, A Space Odyssey. And uh, we had really wonderful conversations. It was most interesting to me, these guys talking about billions of galaxies and I don't know what. Yeah, I, I was just listening. And um, yeah, that was the beginning. And then I, I uh, went back to Germany. I, I wanted to, I was absolutely determined to uh, to marry a particular girl, uh, but I had to wait until she grew up. She was only 17. And then uh, when I came back, she was 20, and then I married her. Yes, she married me. I was very lucky. <laughs> I'm still married to her. <laughs> that was 51 years ago. And um, yeah, uh, so I lived in Zurich. I did my other profession. And, um, but I visited London regularly. 
I'm telling you, you know, my life story in five minutes. Yeah. Uh, I visited London regularly and, and so I talked to Stanley. We played t table tennis and not, not chess. He was, that, that was, he was much better. Uh, and uh, the only area where I could be on the same level with him because he was a brilliant, one of the most intelligent guys I've ever met in my life was music. That was the one area where I, I was sort of, you know, like, okay, I knew my stuff. And uh, it, was, it was a coincidence. Uh, I don't take any credit for it. It was a coincidence that he called me when I came. Uh, they were working on 2001, right? And he said, oh, I said, yes, I have fantastic music. I said, but there's one thing I'm missing. I need something that's really big and comes to an end because the better the music, the harder it is to cut it or fade out. So I said, do you have any idea? So I brought him a whole stack of LPs, right, for needle dropping, right? So Mahler and Holst and what, I don't know, Dvorak, Smetana, you name it. One was called Also Sprach Zarathustra, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. He liked the title already, and he loved this opening fanfare, and that was used in the film. 2001, it was, became very famous. So it's one of those things which are pure coincidences, yeah? So, uh, th yeah, that was my first indirect contribution to his. But then I went back on my job. He asked me in 1969, years later, whether I would work with him for one year going to Romania uh, on Napoleon. He had already worked for two years very intensely on Napoleon. He had become a real scholar on this. Uh, and what fascinated him about Napoleon is the relevance for us today. He didn't want to give anybody a history lesson. Totally, yeah, no, no, it's something else. It's character. It would have fitted into all his films. All his films look, The Shining maybe as an exception, on our folly, our weakness, our vanity. Napoleon, perfect example. Brilliant guy who ruined himself. Nobody else to blame, right? So now, uh, okay, so I thought, well, that was most interesting. So my wife and our baby came to England in 1969. And uh, okay, so we go to Romania, we prepare things. I, did, I looked at all the stuff, with, uh, learned a little bit about it. Uh, Romania, because at that time there was no computer graphics. It didn't exist yet. Everything had to be real. No? I mean, like in 2001, which you have seen this afternoon, everything is black velvet and holes and plywood and brushing and polishing. It's all real. And so we needed a cavalry. And the cavalry you could only get in Eastern European countries. The communist countries were the only countries which had a proper cavalry. I'm not talking about horses and riders. That's different. A cavalry that, moved, that you, know, you, had, you could go to the Soviet Union or to Czechoslovakia, Hungary, yeah, and, and Balkan states, and Romania. So, Ceausescu, not a nice guy, but he also wanted, <laughs> he also wanted the money. And uh, so we had, in principle, a deal. We could have the Romanian cavalry. These were like 15,000 horses and men and officers, the whole lot, huh? for three weeks. Uh, and, and Romania also, had, in the south, it's a very beautiful, Italian, in quotes, country for the first Italian campaign. In the north, in Transylvania, you have mountains and lots of snow in the winter for the Russian campaign of 1812. So these were the two plans. Then MGM pulled out. Why did MGM pull out? Because A, probably they didn't trust the budget. And then uh, uh, Dino de Laurentiis had made a deal uh, with a, for a Soviet, French, American co-production for a film called uh, Waterloo with Rod Steiger. Yeah, okay, that was really, I mean, they really didn't like that. And they thought, okay, then Kubrick comes after that, and ay, ay, ay. So they pulled out. Okay, it was a write off. I was ready to go back to Zurich. Stanley was very depressed for two weeks, but okay, understandable. I mean, you know, he was really geared up to do this. <clears throat> then he said, well, we work together so well. Why don't we do something else? Why don't you stay? And, and my wife had loved England. She had fallen in love with England. And uh, so that was a very important part of my decision. And so we said, okay, fine, let's, let, let's see. Let's see what we do. And um, that might interest you. The first thing I did is buying the rights for a novel called Traum Novelle by Arthur Schnitzler. 
I did that in 1970. And this was the first signed and sealed production distribution agreement with Warner Brothers, 1970. And then Kubrick pulled out. He got scared. He didn't know how to do it. It was the most difficult thing ever. It's a film about sexual fantasy and jealousy. In other words, something where everybody in the audience is an expert. And so he didn't want to do it. And uh, he then, well, gave up. Warner Brothers wanted, however, to make him to do something with him, right? So we did Clockwork Orange. That was easy. That was a cut and paste job. I mean, this was a book written in the first person, and you could really literally cut and paste it into the screenplay. Easy. So did that. Big success, big hit, blah, blah, blah. So, but he wanted to do still Traum Novelle. This was in the back of his mind, and he thought he had an idea before he did The Shining with Woody Allen playing a Jewish New York doctor. <laughs> Straight. And he was absolutely super happy, and he still wasn't happy with the script. Gave up. So now, didn't do it at The Shining. That's different. That's easy. And then, uh, OK, again, this was in the background. But we did something else. We, we prepared a Holocaust film. And then I worked for a year on that in Eastern Europe. This was in the, this was in the early 90s. And Terry Semmel, then the boss of Warner Brothers, called Stanley and said, well, you realize that Steven Spielberg is actually working in Krakow on a film on the different topic. We don't really know what it is, but we know it's about the Holocaust. It's a bad, bad idea <laughs> to come out. Because if his film is a big hit, you have a problem. If his film is a failure, you have a problem. You have a problem, whatever it is. Don't follow Steven Spielberg. So then Stanley postponed it. Now we prepared again for a year, AI, artificial intelligence. That's a film, the book Stanley absolutely loved. And uh, so, yes, uh, we prepared it. And then Stanley offers this film to Steven Spielberg. You, you couldn't make that up, right? But, but that's exactly the truth. I remember Stephen came over. I see these two guys sitting on the big table looking at 600 drawings by Chris Baker. And, and oh, what? Wow, Stanley, very excited. You do it. You know, it's so technical and blah, blah, blah. And, but yeah, OK, fine. So in other words, he gave up on AI, artificial intelligence. Steven Spielberg has had other things in mind to do, but he, he liked it very much. But he had something else planned. Finally, Stanley made. Traum Novelle, it was eyes wide shut, after 30 years, and constantly thinking about it. And he did it, and he was so pleased with that film. He was incredibly pleased. Unfortunately, in the English-speaking world, here and in England and also Northern Europe, it, the film was not successful. It was hugely successful in Japan and in Latin countries. Portugal, Spain, Italy, France, huge. Japan, huge. The rest of the world, forget it. Now, I don't know why. I mean, in the meantime, it's coming up. More and more people realize what an incredibly wonderful film it is. It's difficult, yes. Yes, it's, it's difficult. So what? Yeah? Uh, and uh, I, I spoke to a great expert on, on this topic and a film critic in Rome. And he said, oh, that's quite clear, because we, we, we think it's fantastic. You, you don't. Said, well, what do you mean? It's, well, what's clear? Tell me. Is that has to do with Catholicism. Catholicism? This film has nothing to do with Catholicism. You're wrong. You're wrong. The film has to do with a topic we teach our youngsters. We put it on the table. It exists. It's part of us. It's an incredibly important part of us. And, and, and Freud and Schnitzler and these people, they, they, they knew that. It is, that's us. We are not. You. Anglo-Saxons, you make dirty jokes about it. Interesting. He, I mean, it sounds like a t tremendous oversimplification to me, but you know, maybe there is a grain of truth in it. Anyway, the fact is, it was very successful in France and in Italy, and not at all in England. Now I shut up. That's okay. So, so I want to actually want to go. I want to go back to uh, your background in music. What was you were. Were you in bands? Were you composing? Not what was all. your background I, or interest all. in music? Not at all. I'm a lousy cellist, and I 
uh, I always loved uh, music. My parents were both opera singers. So I grew up with this. I grew up, for me, that was the most normal thing to be totally familiar with Schubert and Schumann and Mozart and Bach and, you know, that, that, what else? <laughs> oh, and I loved Louis Armstrong as a, as a youngster. For me, it was Bach and Louis Armstrong. That was my two big things. <laughs> but then I was 12 or 13. Right. <laughs> uh, but you continued to advise Kubrick on music, or in, was it more oh, of an informal thing, I, playing, I, I, playing him I, I, records? No, always, I always, at, uh, I, he didn't need my advice. I made suggestions. He chose. I loved my role. I have no responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> my responsibility is to get what he needed at the right price at the right time. That was my job. Uh, could, you, could you tell me about uh, how Kubrick discovered Wendy Carlos, the synthesizer yes, pioneer? Yes, absolutely. I can totally tell you, absolutely. Uh, we had Clockwork Orange, futuristic film. We wanted special music, but music he liked. So we had a record called Switched on Bach, and he thought that was terrific, completely new sound with a synthesizer playing mm -hmm. Bach, but playing it properly. Yeah, this is absolutely really Bach. And so we contacted um, Walter Carlos and came over and uh, yeah, made a deal and, and, and he did this wonderful job of, of t t taking the Rossini uh, and, and distorting it, in quotes, electronically, speeding it up. And it, it gave, the, uh, well, not only was it good music, but it gave the air at that time, particularly when it came out in, not in 71, 72, a futuristic flair. So, and you know, it's good, isn't it? Yeah. It's brilliant. And we used it again here for The Shining. And the opening music already is by Wendy Carlos, but it's basically Berlioz. It's a, a part of, of the Symphonie uh, Fantastique, mm -hmm. and it's the DS Eerie. Da, da, di, da, da, di, da, da, da. Yeah, that's the basic melody, and you, you'll hear it right away. For those who haven't seen the film before, it tells you instantly, hey, the, 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 there's something wrong here. <laughs> and it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is this how is this how Kubrick would talk about the music? Would he did he personify it? Because certainly in m almost all of his films, I feel like the music is uh, a very important character uh, uh, that's sometimes omniscient, sometimes subjective and personal and, and conspiring. Always, it has to be subjective. Yeah. It has to be personal. There is no other way for any artist to do anything right unless it is subjective and personal. Look at the paintings. But all great painters, they paint it instantly. They paint it for themselves. You can't, you can't paint for others, unless you are sort of a, a graphical designer who does advertising things. That, I don't mean that. But you, know, you have to do it for yourself, and that's hard enough. So Kubrick found it very, very, very difficult. He was careful, he was slow, he was unbelievably self-critical. And well, all his films last. That he has achieved. Yeah. None of his films disappear. You, know, you can go back to Lolita, to uh, Pass of Glory. They are all there. And uh, I respect it. I mean, I knew him very well then, obviously. And I, I respected him. I loved him. I liked him uh, as a man who, who is just so brilliant. And at the same time, very humble. Yeah? And this is also the sign of great artists. I mean, if you just think of, oh, let me think, um, Mozart, for example. The first thing he, he wrote for, in the magic flute was a fugue, taking a bow to Bach. This is the, the two men, I don't know whether you know, that, um, bum, 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 mm -hmm. bim, bum, 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 then the second voice comes from top, right? So, a bow to Bach. He loved Bach. Beethoven loved Mozart, and he wrote a whole huge piece, cello and piano, on variations from a, a, a melody from the magic flute. There are six, six movements for cello and piano, and so on. Wagner copied by hand the scores of Beethoven symphonies to get a little bit nearer into this mind of this genius. So the, the, the greater the artist, the more respect for others.
They could be a pain in the neck, these people. That's a different story. But they have great respect for other people before them or with them. So Kubrick had enormous respect for other great filmmakers. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, and Kubrick uh, notably would actually use, uh, he would pace some of his entire sequences to pieces of music. Of so, course, music uh, first. For, and, I, and The Shining too, like the, the maze sequence, he would be playing yeah. the entire s- Whenever piece, possible, right? you uh-huh. cut the film to the music, uh-huh. not the other way around. I mean, for example, you have all seen today 2001? Uh, a bunch right? of them, yeah. yeah. All right, you remember the Blue Danube by Johann Strauss? The walls? No. He had something else in mind first. It was other music. As this track was laid, the film was edited. He just didn't like it. Or let me put it like that. He wasn't in love with it. That's much, much more correct. Liking is much too weak. He wasn't in love with it. And he was pondering about this music. Then he came up with this idea of using this walls. He always liked this walls. He liked always waltzes. Waltzes in most of his films. Mm-hmm. He liked this one, two, three, one, two, three. Anyway, so the editing crew was incredibly worried when he suddenly said, well, let's try this. He said, what? A Viennese waltz to, as space music? He, he must have lost his marbles, right? So, but finally he decided we do it. The whole sequence had to be recut and not one bar of the music has been cut. The film was totally cut to the music from the intro to the end. And yeah, that's Kubrick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a, lo- a number of actors who've worked with Kubrick and y- along with yourself have at times referred to Kubrick as being obsessive. This is a, a common comment. Obsessive? On, on, his, on his character. I was wondering what, what specifically, what would he obsess on? Like, Details, big picture. Every artist who is, who is great has to be obsessive. I, my best comparison is you have to be in love. You all know what it is to be in love. You automatically become very obsessive <laughs> because your priority changes instantly. You suddenly have time to go for walks. You never would have gone for walks before. <laughs> right? So if you are in love, you suddenly have time. So, and, and this is how it has to be if you want to make a film. You know, you have to be in love with this idea. This, that's what I want to get across. Yes, call it obsessive. Yeah, it's fine with me. Yes, okay, he was obsessive. Next. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, did he ever have problems moving on from the obsession of one film to the obsessions of the next film? Or was it always a variation of the same obsession that sort of mutated by what he was reading? It is always the same, that he was very careful, very slow in deciding, and, and he, he had to be, he, look, it is so much work, it is so tough to make a film. You can only see this through to make such complex movies as he did, so slow. I mean, Eyes Wide Shut took three years until from beginning to end. If you really are burning with desire to get this done. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, merely a helper. My, my job was, what do you want? I'll try to get it, yeah? Uh, I'm not the filmmaker, but I have observed this tremendous ability to see something through, to be self-critical, to shoot a whole scene and throw it out because you don't like it and do it again. This, this takes character. He was a great man. Yeah. Uh, the first time I taught my history of punk class here, uh, I started off the class by screening A Clockwork Orange, and uh, which some of you might scratch your heads at that because that film is 1970, 71. The punk movement starts in 76, 77. Um, but a lot of the fashion and also just the aesthetics of rebellion in A Clockwork Orange, the UK punks especially, picked up on. Um, so I, I was wondering if Kubrick, was, was he aware of the punk movement? Was, was, did it show well, up on his radar? Well, I, I can't say that. I mean, that, 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 that's, that, this is not a question I, I cannot truthfully answer because I don't know mm. where. He, he wanted to make a good film. 
th th that's hard enough. You don't think of what consequences might it have for uh, the future, forget it. It has to be good now. And uh, he wanted to make a film that was set in the future. So you do everything that comes to mind that's affordable to do, and, and you execute it. And Clockwork Orange is a perfect example to teach students how to do with very little, a lot. Right. Now, mind you, you have the book. It's all in the writing. You have the book. So that, that is, of course, a huge given. But the execution is, is just, yeah. just that. Just try to do the best. The costumes are very cheap. The designs, but no big deal. Yeah. We used locations. We didn't go into a studio. You, you, yeah, you just dress it up. You try to fantasize with the designer. Of course, we had clever designers. Uh, what, what might the future look like? Whether it does or does not, you, that's what you have to do at that moment. Yeah. yeah, I guess it was more of a question of reflection, like when he was, would have been in London in the late 70s and suddenly seeing these droogs pop up on street corners, uh, how that well, might have affected They didn't him. exist. They yeah. did, they, that was these, these four droogs with their white uh, things, there was no example, that was just cooked up. Yeah, but, but the punks picked up <laughs> later on, on it you later, mean. later oh, on. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, that, well, yeah. that can happen. So. Yeah. But, uh, but we, look, look we, we, I walked in Santa Monica three, four years um, ago, and there was a guy with a T-shirt with the twins from The Shining on it. Yeah? You did, we didn't think that this would happen either. Yeah? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, how, would, uh, uh, how would Kubrick select his, or get introduced to the books that he would go on to adapt? Different, different sources, or? Well, it's, my, it's the same answer. He, he really had to be fascinated by the book and, and loved it and thought it would be possible to put it onto the screen. And most books fall away from that. Most big novels can't be put properly onto the screen, and that's why the new television technique of a series is such a good idea, because suddenly you can do uh, David Copperfield properly. You just take 10 hours and it's gone right. Yeah, but you cannot do it in two. Yeah? And so there are many, many books were ruined by films which they, because they had to put it into two hours and it's pathetic. Yeah? So, um, and many books could simply, he would like them, but he, it was out of the question. But if it was possible to do it, then he did not. The Shining, he, uh, one of the conditions that he took the, book on was he could change whatever he wanted. Yeah, and Stephen King was happy with that. And then he, Stephen King didn't like the film, but that's, that's his problem. But, um, but, uh, right. yeah, but he agreed that Stanley could do whatever he wanted because nothing in that film makes any sense. But and that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great, yeah, and it's lovely. As, as, as you said, you know, you look at the architecture. You know, and somebody said, of course, said, but, but, but Mr. Kubrick, you know, the, these rooms could never be in the house that we have established. It's a ghost film, period. And you know, once you say it's a ghost film, you get away with murder. <laughs> uh, so K Kubrick uh, in, his, in his home had uh, his own projection room, and it's sort of well known among all the sort of people who have written about Kubrick, talking about the experience of him screening films all weekend. You were there Absolutely. for film after film after film. We screened film. it ourselves. I mean, we changed the reels. We changed it, right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what, when he was preparing for The Shining, did this mean that the projection room was stacked high with The Exorcist and Rosemary's Baby and? No, not at all. It was, it would have been, we would have maybe looked for actors. Mm. Now that's a different criteria. Oh no, quite the opposite. He didn't want to be influenced. He wouldn't want to look at, at, at horror films. It might influence you, it blocks you, rather than helps you to think freely. Yeah. No, no, not at all, yeah. not at all. We were looking for cast, that's right, yeah. yeah. I know at, at UCLA when I was there for film school there were sort of uh, two, two schools of thought on what, how you would prepare for making a film. And one was you see everything that's in your genre or in your something similar to what yeah, you're making, um, so you did, know to not, not make the same mistakes, not he didn't, repeat. He didn't work like that. He didn't uh, and then like other, yeah, other filmmakers who stay yeah. the hell away yeah. from everything that yeah. has to do with 
yeah. with that genre. He didn't work like that at all. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what what sort of research did he do re with regards to genre? Since The Shining is a horror a horror film of sorts. It's the first time he want. He, I mean, yeah, he, he wanted to try it once. Basically, it's not within his normal interest. But he wanted to, okay, let's try it, right? Okay, we'll do that. But as I said, he had to have the right to do whatever he wanted, and he got that right. So there was no, you know, he, because he changed it from the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, that's what he liked. And he tried to do his best. Now, he didn't travel, right? So that was, of course, a, a problem. So it had to, uh, okay, you see, in, have, um, okay, have you seen The Shining before? Most of it, okay. You know, there is this hotel. Right, that hotel is actually called Timberline Lodge in Oregon. And uh, the cameraman, um, Doug Milsom, and I, we were the crew. <laughs> Just two guys. You know, this was filmmaking in the raw. A 2C, an Array 2C, a set of lenses, a tripod, and batteries, period. So we were at Timberline Lodge. A wonderful holiday, actually. Yeah? And had to wait for virgin snow because all the ski, ski, ski tracks had to be covered. So it had to be look like there's really nobody in that hotel. Well, let me tell you, it was packed with people, but they, they, didn't, they were not early risers. <laughs> so we had to wait for the light to be just right to get that exposure. You have about 15 minutes, you know, when you can, at F2, at F2 you get an exposure, and you still, and our, the lights you see in the hotel are our bedrooms. And we had a thousand watt lower lights and lots of uh, paper in the window. Uh, and, and these were the lights. So we waited for, okay, good day, good day. It's a clear morning. Off we go. Very early in the morning. You go with a snow cat the other way around. Get ready. Wait until you just get an exposure and the lights in the window are still right. That was a job. I call it a holiday. <laughs> yeah. And then we had breakfast. And then later came all the skiers, crawled out of their bed, and, and, and ruined this beautiful snow with their, with their skis. <laughs> and we joined them. <laughs> yeah. uh, at what point did Kubrick uh, stop traveling and start sort of filming uh, from, from home? Hard to home say. I, he never traveled well, since I knew him. I think his mm. last flight was after Spartacus oh, wow. you know, to Spain. He had, he, was a, he had a pilot's license. He flew himself at Cessna. He was, a, as a young man, he was a, a, a photo reporter for Look magazine. Mm -hmm. And there were, must have been some traumatic experiences and a friend got killed and he developed this phobia. Now, phobias are never logical. You know, some people are afraid of frogs. There's nothing you can do about it. You know, or of spiders. Many people are, have, have a thing about spiders. They are so harmless, you know, but nevertheless, yeah. And so he knew that it, statistically speaking, the safest way of travel is probably the aeroplane, <laughs> yeah. But he didn't go near one. He absolutely not, absolutely not. And and he followed on the radio. He had a special shortwave radio. It's not. I'm not gossiping. Uh, uh, to listen to the uh, pilot and tower exchange at London Heathrow Airport. Yeah, and uh, he was fascinated by the conversations, particularly when there was fog, and some mm. yeah, uh, some were divided. And then he said, "Oh, he it came came for lunch." He said, "Absolutely crazy." There is this Swiss guy, and he said, "Well, I I think I try a landing." <laughs> he said, "He must be nuts." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so these were as wonderful wonderful yeah, stories. Yeah. No, so, he was great. Yeah. So, but um, anyway, why don't we watch the film? Uh, and then maybe afterwards, if you okay. want to, we can talk about it. Ted, you're the boss. Is that good for you? Yeah, that's fine. And then afterwards, you can maybe sign my record. Maybe. I'm happy to. <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, so let's move the chairs and uh, we'll start the film. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my question, oh, this one is better. <laughs> yeah, my question was, um, yeah, uh, do you know if, ah, okay, do I know what? F from the beginning, I noticed a pattern in um, most of Stanley Kubrick's uh, um, movies in terms of architecture and patterns and colors. I'm very interested to know what are his influences, like what, 
inspires him to decide like I wanna I want a green and um, a purple color with with the random like crazy All music. Right. But there is a there is a ho there is a hotel in California um, somewhere I forgot where it is which we try to copy. Hotel California. Pardon? Yeah, uh, we tried try to copy. We used the colors. They, they had also these uh, Ind American Indian uh, emblems, and we used those. So, you know, we, we basically copied it. Now, the fact that the Timberland Lodge, as I said before, is totally different and doesn't match, he wasn't bothered by it. Because, in fact, he liked the fact mm -hmm. that he, he showed right away it isn't logical. Yeah. Nothing makes sense. Yeah. He liked that. He was riding on that, that nothing makes sense. And uh, now, how come uh, this poor man, you know, is in the end in this photograph, 1921? And his explanation was, well, explanation was right. He always said, I never explain anything. I don't understand myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is, of course, a big cop out, but, but nevertheless, yeah. yeah. So the, the architecture is a copy. Yeah. It's, it's really, you know, we had designers. And they copied it very well and made it also that it is practical. Whenever you see actors, it's on a stage in London, in Bourne Wood, to be precise. The exteriors were no actors. You have the hotel, that's really in Oregon. But when you see actors, it's not really the hotel, it's only part of the hotel. And it's, it's, a, it's on scaffold. And the snow is uh, formaldehyde with salt on it. In, on the stage. So, you know, it was, was a difficult thing. And at the, the night shots were terrible because um, uh, it was, um, when, when, whenever you have a little bit of wind, then the whole s artificial smoke fog is blown away. So it's a nightmare. Um, but so, well, it's called filmmaking. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thanks. Come nearer. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, but uh, uh, the acoustics are, are, is it better like this? So now, well, I'm sure you understand me, but no. Yeah, I was just curious about the reaction shots. Like yes. when she's standing in the doorway watching the blood come out of the elevator. When were those shot? You know, in what order? Were the reactions after all of that set up at the beginning when they're in Boulder? When was that, when was that filmed? The reaction shots, yeah. it's all on the stage. Whenever you see an actor, it's on the stage or on the set. And of course, the whole style is slightly overacting. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, Jack Nicholson is basically chewing the curtains. You know? but, <laughs> but yeah, all right, that's the style of the film. You know, it's a puppet show, really. Yeah. Uh, we also wanted to know when. Pardon? When? The sequencing of the shooting. Oh, very just good. All the screaming. Did you just oh, shoot no, 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 oh, no. Today's the scream day and you shot all the screaming. You try to do the all reactions very, very quickly. Otherwise, it's difficult to do. No, no. You have all the actors there. They don't go home. You know? They're all there. And you do one after the... No, no. That, as fast as possible, you do the reaction shots. Check. Is this a good mic or should I take this that? This is good. Check. Okay, so um, this was my first time watching 2001 A Space Odyssey, and this was also my first time watching The Shining. And I'm curious with what Michael Block said about, is there something that pulls Kubrick into these stories? Is there something that he wants in the, a theme? And you kind of mentioned that it was, it was the heart of the artist that kind of has connected him to all of his films. Watching these two movies, two scenes that really clicked for me as connecting are these pleading moments in, an, in The Antagonist. Um, you have Hal in the moments of please, please, please don't as he's pulling out his um, computer guts. And then you have this moment with Jack Nicholson who's also in this pleading moment. And they just, they feel like there's something similar there. Am I, is the, I'm just curious if there's a pattern, if, if it's, it just seems like I don't know. I mean, I, I really, uh, the, uh, so, so much has been uh, interpreted 
out of The Shining, which is all complete nonsense. It, it's, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, okay. the, the, the film, it, this story doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And so you, you have to enjoy the fact that it is beautifully executed, very carefully executed. Don't ask for how come, why. It, there is no answer. Yeah. It's a horror film. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's not even a horror film, it's a horror puppet show. Act it. And that's what Stanley wanted. It is a, it, it, it stick, if you know all the Kubrick films, this one sticks out. Yeah. This one is very different. All the other films are fundamentally serious. Yeah. This is not. It just isn't. And many people want it to be so serious because it's a Kubrick film. It must be serious. Well, it isn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? Uh, th that's all I can say. He, he himself thought, I mean, Okay, but what, what, I mean, th this whole thing is, is so absurd, yeah? But th there you are, <laughs> uh, yeah? I mean, you know, many people think he shouldn't have wasted his time with it and should have made a, a, a proper story. But, you know, he wanted to try it and uh, he failed. The film was not a success. Yeah. The film by now, because it is not a normal horror film, is sort of almost uh, an icon, you know, oh, it's the best horror film ever. It was a flop when it came out. Because, because the normal horror film audience wants a resolution. They want to know why, who, and, and, and how come, and then the stake through the heart. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's, a, but here's nothing. I mean, you see the guy is frozen, and then you see him in this picture, 1921, how come? How co who, threw the, who, who throws the tennis ball in the corridor? Don't ask these questions. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Kubrick didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's all all a puppet show fantasy. Whoever first. Now, if you have seen, have, have you seen 2001 this afternoon? Oh, no, no. I mean, that is a wonderful, very serious film. It, is a, it takes a bow to the unknowable. We don't know anything. It's, a, it's actually not, I don't even think it's a science fiction film. It's a philosophical film. And uh, what in, what's interesting about 2001 is also when it came out, it was not well received by the establishment. The film was rescued by youngsters, by people be, uh, aged 12 to 25. They liked the film. Yeah, uh, uh, but but you know, many, many, there were very, very prominent uh, film critics who considered the film outright boring. And as an artist, there's nothing you can say. You can't say, no, it is not. If you think it's boring, well, then that's just what it is. Yeah, so he, he had a tough time. He had a tough time always with his films. He always split the critics and split the audiences, but the films remained. That's already something. Hi, I wanted to know what is one of your best or most prominent memories from being on set for this Can film? Can you come a bit closer? It's, <laughs> it's the acoustics here because I, I lip read more than I admit. For this film? Oh, being in Oregon skiing. <laughs> I have no question about it. That was wonderful. The second unit work, just the, uh, the cameraman and myself in Oregon, beautiful, high up on Timberline Lodge. You can't beat it. No, I mean, on the set, well, it's just, you know, you got, that's work. It's, it's, I mean, you have to constantly watch that, that your part is, is, is there. Everything has to be right. I cleared rights for music and it changed all the time. I cleared many, many more music rights than we actually used and all this stuff. This is real work. And uh, that's why I don't do it anymore. <laughs> I'm too old, <laughs> you know. I have been often asked uh, after Kubrick's death whether I would do this for others. I said, look, I'm, I do my own stuff. I did some documentaries. That's easy. But uh, I, I, I wouldn't want to do this. Oh, well, I made one, yeah. I worked on pre-production with Steven Spielberg. That's true. But that's, that was also easy because uh, I, I basically had all the material from, because we worked on it for over a year. 
Yeah. Yeah, so greatest moment, I don't know. I had a good time. I loved my work all the time, yeah. How are you doing, sir? Can you hear this? I yeah, can hear you. Uh, I'm wondering if you've noted that The Shining's been hacked to death. Uh, people have been looking for a theory or some kind of pattern. You're saying, don't do this, right? But uh, is, is Kubrick, as you knew him, was he a superstitious man or into the occult or, or anything of that nature? He's mm. explored it in more than one of his films. No, no I, I don't think so. He was a political guy. He was interested in politics, and you can see this. I mean, think of, of films like Dr. Strangelove, which was supposed to be, you see that tomorrow, I believe. It was conceived first as a straight film. And it, it, you know, the book, Red Alert, is a, is a straight book. And then he realized this is so absurd what we are doing that he used comedy not to make it funny as such, but to underpin the seriousness. And he succeeded. Uh, Pass of Glory, a very serious film, First World War, uh, Full Metal Jacket, a film about the abuse of young men. This has been done for 2,000 years, since the Spartan army, yeah? Uh, and and um, have you seen Full Metal Jacket, or are you going, is it part of your program? Well, I mean, you, you realize that the, the seven principal actors, they're all about 10 years too old. But we couldn't find seven actors of the right age where the Marines would take them. They want 19-year-olds. Find 19-year-old great actors. That's very, very difficult. That's why DiCaprio is such a superstar. He was good at 12 and he stayed good. We needed seven. Girls is easier because they're mature at that age. Men are not tough. I mean, you know, I, I have three sons and I was myself 19. I know. I'm an expert. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and so we finally gave up. We had 2,000 casting tapes for Full Metal Jacket. We are not calling, going all over the place now, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, and and we, we finally gave up. It was kindergarten, yeah. It was, uh, <laughs> so we, then we used real proper actors. They were 26, 27, 28, or well, that's fine, yeah. Then they're grown up. So your, everything was a struggle. Nothing is easy, but that was also part of the fun. I have no idea whether I answered your question. <laughs> You've given a uh, very fantastic anecdote anyway. <laughs> okay. um, I just want to know, um, how was the scene with the blood coming back? How, how, how was the scene with the blood coming from behind the walls shot? Uh, I didn't get that. What was the question? How was the scene? How was the scene? With the blood coming behind the walls? In, in slow motion, you see like red blood. Oh, the blood. Oh, yeah. that. How was it? Oh, these are prop people. They are very experienced. You know, this was water, obviously. It was yeah, red yeah. water. And uh, you, you, it's a tank. Uh -huh. and, and you have, you, have uh, you know, prop people and the builders. They know exactly how to do this. And, and then you, you slide it open and you film it with a high-speed camera. So in, in a, instead of doing 24 frames a second, you do have one camera running at 120, 180, after, after, so that you have a choice. You only have one take, mm. that's for sure. Mm. One take, and you do it with five different cameras of five speeds, and in the editing you decide. But it's not that difficult, it's just a mess. <laughs> because afterwards, you know, all, everything is, oh, it's just revolting, yeah? But, it's, it's, not, it's not difficult. There are loads of technicians who can do that easily. But there were like chairs falling apart and it was like... Completely there were these chairs, they were swimming in the water. <laughs> they were just ruined. I mean, yeah, but you know that up front. You know, you, 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 it's, it's one take. Yeah. No fun. <laughs> Thank you. It's also nerve-wracking because you don't want to repeat it. What else? Uh, we all sort of know that Jack Nicholson was overeating the scenes. He was sort of chewing the scenery, as it were. Uh, did Kubrick ever tell him to sort of elevate his acting, to like overreact to certain oh, oh, scenes? Oh, yes. I mean, they talked or, like, about it, of course. And it's totally, it, it, what I said, it's puppet show. It's, 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 and, and, and Jack loved it because, you know, normally as an actor, you can't do this, you know, because so absolutely overacting. But yeah, that's the style of the film, and uh, some people, most people didn't like it. Well, uh, it's just too bad. <laughs> yeah, it's, there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, you, know, you could say it's a big mistake that Kubrick made that film in the first place. 
But you may be right. Maybe you should have done something else. Yeah, but there you are. No, no, they, they discussed it very, very carefully, of course. That was the style of the film. The film doesn't make any, uh, any demands on being taken terribly seriously. Yeah, this is not Hamlet, yeah, no. Campy <laughs> yeah. qualities to the film. I beg your pardon? There were definitely some uh, campy qualities to the film as well. Yeah, the of course there yeah. are. Yeah. You're absolutely <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Okay, hi. Um, I was just curious what it was like working with uh, Jack Nicholson. Yeah. Oh, dude, he's, a to he's a total pro, complete professional. He is on time, and, and I mean, it's just a totally professional actor. Yeah, I mean, this is absolutely uh, nothing to it. Did he go skiing with you? I beg your pardon? Did he go skiing with you? <laughs> skiing? Jack Nicholson? Yeah. No, he was, the whole film was made in England, uh, in Borm Wood on the stage. He was never in the snow. The, whenever you see the, the hotel, that second unit, Kubrick wasn't there either. Yeah, uh, that was uh, Jack Milsom and myself. And then whenever you see actors, it was in Bournemouth, which is a town north of London, where the studios are there. Today still, it's, it's uh, Elstree Studios and Television Studios, they're still there. There used to be a big MGM studio, and that has now been turned into a, a, a cool uh, warehouse for frozen food. Sorry, but that's just how it is. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, I was wondering how the sex scenes inside Clockwork Orange were filmed. Clockwork Orange? Yeah, the sex scenes, the ones that are sped up. Um, yes. Like, how, like, what inspired that? Because I read the book, and then it, it feels like, it, feels like it, it captures it perfectly. Yeah, it's a good film. Oh, now, Clockwork Orange is a serious yeah. film. That's different. It was totally made on location, never in a studio. And uh, it was made, it's a cheap, relatively cheap film, yeah. Uh, Malcolm McDowell at that time was no star at all. I mean, all the actors were just normal and it uh, uh, was a huge success because it's really a serious story. And it is, unfortunately, was a bit prophetic, yeah, uh, because we have that problem of bad behavior, <laughs> uh, I think um, on a, almost on a daily basis, <laughs> yeah, so, but yeah, I don't know whether that was answers to your question. I was wondering, the, the sex scene, the one that sped uh, up really fast. Was it fast? No, the, the sex scene. The, the sex that, scene? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, well, oh, you know. up, like, and then oh, yeah, yeah, that was high speed, because yeah, you, can't, yeah. you can't do that normal speed. Yeah, it's really, <laughs> yeah? I mean, it's, it's very interesting. Um, yeah. But like in the, in the book, they like, it's like, it's a fast scene, like they really go over and then it's the movie, he like goes faster. Well, yeah, like, well, okay, we have two of those scenes and they are turned into ballet almost. Yeah. The first one is when the gangs meet, right? And the girl is on the stage, and the girl is on the stage. By the way, that theater, which no longer exists, was the theater where Charlie Chaplin played in London as a young man, yeah? But anyway, it was still there, it was derelict, it was a real ruin, and we could use it. It has, a few years later, it was demolished. And, um, right, but, but this violence that is expressed there, Stanley wanted to lift this into something artistic. And he did it to music and ballet and unrealistic in a way, but yeah, it works. The high speed, other, uh, later on, that was ne simply necessary but it also it's grotesque. Well, it was meant like that, but it, it, it's not pleasant. Certainly not, no, not the, well, yeah, the, but it, we were very lucky to have such a wonderful actor like uh, Malcolm McDowell. I mean, he was hugely talented and he made a big career. Yeah, he lives not far from here. He lives in Ojai. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, what, two hours or so? He's a lovely guy, and I made a documentary about him, uh, which was fun to do. It's called Old Lucky Malcolm. Uh, it's a Warner Brothers documentary, and uh, I think it's, it's out with Clockwork Orange. And um, yeah, he told me, oh, I made about 140 films, and uh, almost all of them are bad. <laughs> well, it's very hard to make a great movie here, very difficult. 
Thank you so much, Jan. That was great. Uh, and it's still going on. It's great. Um, I was watching this documentary from Kubrick's daughter last night about this movie. You know, yeah. I'm sure you, she was probably filming you, you on set. You, which, what is it called? Uh, it's, I don't remember what it's called. It's from Vivian Kubrick. Oh. It's uh, like that, that 30 was, minutes long. Oh, that was fun. Yeah, A yeah, really yeah. nice, nice piece. Yeah, oh, yeah I'm not sure if good. I saw you in there. You had different Excellent. Hair. But what I was so amazed by was the constant changing of the script. Like, they, they had to issue the script on different colored paper every 15 minutes absolutely. to make sure that everyone had the same version of the script. Yeah, absolutely. And right. I was just curious if, I kept thinking, like, what's the status of the script on this film versus other films that Kubrick did? Did, did he ever more slavishly follow a script, or was it always, like, day by day, constantly no, and organically no, no, updated? No, 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 that was only the case in The Shining. Yeah. The, the, the moment you make a film, nothing makes any sense. The script is much, much harder to do than if a story has a clear flow. Right. Yeah? Because there is no clear flow. It's such nonsense. Yeah? And uh, now, if you, if you think of, uh, of, for example, Eyes Wide Shut, uh, that was absolutely uh, clear given, and, and yeah, that was very, very different. No, no, uh, he didn't, but I, I remember it very, very well. Uh, on, 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 on The Shining, it was desperate. I mean, you know, it constantly changed. Yeah, like, like yeah. Nicholson is leaning over eating noodles on the table, and yeah. three feet away, Kubrick yeah. is typing yeah. Yeah. away yeah, the yeah, new right. lines, and it's like absolutely. 4 a.m., and it's just yeah. insanity, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, so, you're right. So I, I'm, I'm, that's so interesting. So it was really that movie. Yeah. It wasn't all, it's that, that's, that wasn't the M.O. of all of the films. No. Interesting. Well, yeah, so he was a very self-critical man. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you make a film where nothing makes any sense, it's very hard to live with. Yeah, I, I'm, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's tricky. If you make a serious film, it's so much better to judge it. It's so much easier to judge it. Yeah, whether it's right or not, yeah. Anyone else? Questions? Now, uh, uh, tomorrow we have this, we do, we do serious work, right? Yes, <laughs> serious work. <laughs> okay, then, um, yeah. Anything then we else? can, uh, much more systematically with examples, uh, I can demonstrate what, what the aim is. I mean, the, for me, Kubrick was the greatest teacher one could have for 30 years, yeah? It was just amazing how, how good and how careful and how self-critical he was, and I really learned an enormous amount from him, yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess I'll ask one question to close it out. Um, you mentioned earlier Kubrick's, uh, I mean, the, the constantly changing critical response to his films. Some critics loved it, some critics hated the films. Did, did Kubrick care about what the critics said? Yeah, sure he did. Of course he cared about it, but he ha you have no choice. You know, as a, as a, as a person who, who, who wants to do really good work, you, you can only try to please yourself. We talked about this before. You know, it, it's like a painter. A painter can't, a great painter can't paint for others. Yes, he, he has to himself be pleased with this result, and then just have hope. The same is true for a composer or for a novelist. You know, there's nothing you can do. You have no choice in the matter. You know, uh, Vincent van Gogh never sold a painting in his life other than to his brother. And he was ridiculed by, by the professionals, by the uh, yeah, critics. Uh, the, 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 uh, people thought that when, when Turner did his greatest paintings that he had lost his head, you know, he was crazy. And that was his m unbelievable, <laughs> yeah, how, what he did, he shifted. He was like a switcher. He shifted everything into the French Impressionism. You know, a, a, all painters painted differently after that. There was an absolute change, yeah? and. Um, then came Picasso and all these people. I mean, that's what great artists do. But it doesn't mean they're, they're immediately recognized as such. Because critics are, have, are very sensitive to suddenly something they're not familiar with. It must be bad. <laughs> you know, it's a problem. You have architects. I mean, goodness me. Oh, look who is here. Do you think he was applauded? 
Uh, when, he, when he did this strange, absolutely not, Hundertwasser, these people who come up with really new ideas, it doesn't mean that everybody says they're wonderful, not at all. Now, yes, yeah? Or then this wonderful man, in, uh, Lloyd Wright, in, 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 in Los Angeles. He was from Los Angeles, wasn't he? The, the architect? I mean, what, what amazing things. But don't think everybody immediately thought it was, he was great. You know, artists have a, have a tough time. That's just how it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jan. Thanks to all of you for coming out.